at Subway. Start your day the flavorful way by adding new guacamole to your favorite breakfast sandwich. Perfectly made with a hint of jalapeno, our guacamole turns up the flavor to your breakfast. Try it today on a hot and toasty egg white and cheese. Subway. Eat fresh. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. The BS Report. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report, a special Game 7 World Series edition. We are taping this at 9 in the morning West Coast time. Jonah Carey from Grantland is coming on right now. And, and uh, my friend Connor Shell, who uh, I created 30 for 30 with, longtime Royals fan, Longtime suffering Royals fan in Kansas City went last night. He's going to give us a little report. Jonah, why the why wouldn't the Royals win tonight? There's no Bumgardner, and they're great. The Royals are great at home. Their relievers are rested. Why isn't this just a slam dunk? Royals win Game Seven. Well, they're favored. There's something like minus one twenty coming into this game, so that's you know something of a favorite. Although that's mostly home field with that edge. Uh, Bumgardner's going to pitch. He's not going to start, but he's going to pitch. And I think that could be a big question is how much does he pitch and when does he come into the game? I'm a big uh, Yuzmero Petit supporter. He got lit up yesterday on a bunch of bloops. There was one ball that was hit hard, but everything else was like a grounder in the dirt and bloops and whatever. But generally speaking, I thought that Petit should be starting or at the very least should come in before the game gets out of hand. It was already the bases loaded with one out and it was 2 nothing. It was a very tough situation for him to come into. Same thing with Bumgarner tonight. I don't have much faith in Tim Hudson. So if Bumgarner comes in in the second inning and it's 1-1 or whatever, then that's not so bad. If he comes in in the fourth inning and it's 5 nothing Royals, then that's a big problem. But it's what's called his throw day, which basically means his between start day that he would throw, which could be anywhere from like 30 to 50 pitches. If he throws 30 to 50 pitches in the game, that could be three or four innings. And if he comes in in a tie game for three or four innings, that could be a difference maker. I heard I was driving to get coffee this morning. I heard Kurt Schilling on ESPN Radio, and he said – First of all, he said he wouldn't pitch him at all. Wow. And then he said if he pitches him, he'd only pitch him for one batter. He thought he thought one inning was too much. He thought it was too risky. But we've seen – can you think of other situations yes. where we've seen teams push? Because I remember – you know, everyone forgets this, but the 2004 Red Sox. Yes. Derek Lowe starts game seven on mm. two days rest. I think he threw 80 pitches. He threw 68 pitches. He gave up one run on one hit in six innings. And because they had Pedro and Schilling and they broke the curse and all this stuff, which is not a real curse, they, people kind of forget it. That is one of the best pitching performances of my lifetime. I Just Lowe's yeah. not that big a high-profile pitcher, so it's forgotten. It's probably one of the five best game, best pitched games I've ever seen, given the circumstances. It was incredible. Right, and there were so many heroes during yep. those four days that it just became hard to keep track. And I think just in a vacuum, if, if that had been the one heroic performance, I think it would have been remembered a lot differently. But I mean, it was the day after Schilling, Schilling had the bloody sock and, yeah. and, uh, and then all the Dave Roberts and Ortiz, all the other stuff that happened. But so, so it seems like you think Bumgarner is, is, is actually going to throw a few innings here. I could see more than one inning. A few is a very broad spectrum. That could be one and a third, or it could be like three and two thirds. And, and you know, he obviously is going to say that he'll throw as many as he wants. Uh, Buster only interviewed him and, uh, or, inter- you know, talked in the interview room and asked him, well, how many pitches do you think you could throw? And he j- probably not jokingly said 200. I think I could go 200. That should be fine. <laughs> so that would be an interesting performance and probably a record. Uh, I'm pretty sure, but uh, we'll see. I, I think it's conceivable that that could happen. Uh, you know, with Baumgartner and Petit threw 17 pitches yesterday, so he'll be available too. The big thing, aside from those guys, though, is the Giants really need to use Jeremy Affelt more aggressively. And, you know, it's listen, if you're not necessarily a Giants fan or a diehard NL West fan, you might not realize how good Affelt is. He's one of the best relievers in baseball, even though he's not a closer. A lefty who gets lefties and righties out 13 times, he threw more than one inning in a game, meaning he's a multi-inning guy. And he could be a shutdown guy. It's been weird to me to see him a little bit underused in the World Series and the playoffs. If they use him aggressively and Baumgartner and maybe Petit to some extent as well, that could negate the Kansas City bullpen advantage because all three of those guys are really good. What would you have done differently for game six? Because, you know, as a Red Sox fan, I was 98% convinced Jake Peavy was getting shelled last night. Would you have just started Petit in that game? Well, and the extra 2%, of course, was with conviction. But yes, um, (laughs) uh, yeah, I would have started Petit. Well, I wanted, you know, we did... uh, and, and by the way, I should uh, tell people that if you're reading Gradlin, check out uh, Ben Lindbergh, who's been awesome. Michael Bauman, awesome. Randy Gisarelli, we've been covering it, uh, you know, just 
uh, wall to wall. And at the beginning of the series, my contribution was we were talking about keys to the World Series. My number one key to the World Series was start Yuzumero Petit. And I wanted, mm. I figured game four, I figured he'd start in place of Ryan Vogelsong, who by the way got shelled as well. Petit ended up relieving Vogelsong and they won that game. But it was one of those things where Bochi was kind of figuring, okay, previous precedent would, would be fine here that you know, Petit had pitched six innings in that crazy 18-inning game in the NLDS against the Nationals and and basically won the game for them. And then yeah. he came in and relieved Vogelsong and won the game for them again. And then he did it again. So it was sort of, okay, well, obviously this is working. Let's go with it. And it's kind of specious reasoning. It's like, yeah, it happened to work out, but why not just save yourself the heartache and play your better guy? Petit is a better pitcher uh, at this point than PV is. He's certainly fresher. And I think you could say the same about Hudson, and you certainly could about Vogelsong. I could just tell you as somebody who wagered on the Royals before the wild card game in 18 one odds and has jumped on the bandwagon for these four <laughs> weeks. P- Petit is the pitcher on that team that I'm afraid of other than Bumgarner. And, and I, I was delighted that they didn't start him last night. I just thought at, when, at gunpoint, Bochy was going to be like, you know what? What am I doing? I'm just going to start Petit. Why, why am I even <laughs> risking this? He's just going to come in in the second or third inning anyway. I just, I'm just starting him. But he didn't. And now we have a game seven. And man, this this Royals thing, it's amazing. And it's fun. You know, you think like all these teams that just hitch themselves to potential and prospects and the Keith Law top 100 having guys in there and just hoping these assets turn into something. <laughs> and then to watch it actually happen, I thought was astounding. And and I should say, I was wrong about the Royals. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Going all the way back to the James Shields trade, Shields doesn't pitch that well in the playoffs, but they're not here if it's not for his contributions in the regular season. Right. Wade Davis came over in that trade. Well, he's been pretty darn good. Yeah. So, I mean, that's worked out great for them, and uh, and we'll see. It doesn't mean that the Rays are necessarily going to lose that trade. Myers could be good over time. That's fine, but that was a good move. And I think the big thing was the development of Danny Duffy and Yordano Ventura. That honestly, aside from, well, that really, and Wade Davis is the biggest difference in this year's team versus last year's team, which was a good team, but not as good. You know, Ventura doing what he did yesterday was – astounding and man that guy has a little bit of swag you know staring down sandoval mm. after you there's just it was it was great i mean people were citing the pedro comparison which you know for you or i were both the biggest pedro fans is blasphemy but yeah, yeah he's a little guy he's got a lot of swagger to him and he's really good throws hard so there's something to that and duffy also a big contributor this year so it's one of those things where they had the position players come along you know you had gordon and uh, Mustakas has been up and down, granted, but Hosmer and Escobar, who was, uh, came over in a trade, you know, they have these guys that have come along, but they really didn't have the pitching. To go get Shields, to add Davis, for Herrera to develop, and then to get Duffy and Ventura, all of a sudden, you know, you have a young prospect team, but it's a team that's good on both ends, and that's really what it came down to. And I've had Hosmer for his entire professional career in the League of Dorks, dating nice. back to the minors, and... You know, he was one of those guys that just would never put it together. And every time you felt like he was getting hot and he was going to turn into George Brett, he would go 10 for 80. In somewhere in September, which ironically was the last month he was on our roster. Now he's a free agent because we had him for all four years. Hmm. But somewhere in September, he turned into the guy we had been waiting for for years and years and years. And that kind of carried through. And I feel like when I look at this Royals team, I just feel like he's the heart of the team. That and the bullpen. Those are the two things. You know, and it's it's not a lot in baseball to get hot for four weeks. You you really need the seventh, eighth, ninth inning relievers. And you need that one galvanizing present presence in the lineup. And then all the you have to do all the little things correctly. But why I mean, why didn't people think the Royals could do this in September? I think that people st- and by the way, we're all guilty. It's not like I'm, I know and nobody else does. We, we all do this. We just tend to fixate on the teams that are better in the regular season. Yeah. And we forget that baseball is, is almost random in the playoffs. I mean, basketball is not random. You can't, you know, if Charlotte makes the playoffs this year, you don't say, wow, well, Charlotte, they're a sleeper. They're, no, there's a 0% chance that they're going to go on to win the title. It's going to yeah. be a better team. Because you can put the ball in the hands of your best guys in basketball. Baseball is random. You know, Mark Lemke could come up in the order with the game on the line, and that's how Mark Lemke becomes a guy whose name we still know 20-odd years later. That's the thing about that. Dave Roberts, you know, was a good utility kind of guy, you know, backup, could steal a couple bases. And Dave Roberts never has to buy a drink in Boston for the rest of his life. That is how baseball works. It just it can make heroes or goats out of whoever happens to be in the way of the truck. And, and that, that's what's really fascinating about it. And, you know, by that token, 
you just take the biggest underdog period. You know, as long as they have any kind of a pulse, then yeah. it's worth a shot. It's worth an 18 to one play as we've seen coming into game seven of the world series. Well, and also they could have lost the wild card game 17 different times. So it's Should not, it's not yeah. like this was a genius bet, but where Sal and I talked that day and I had watched the Royals in September just cause I, I like the Royals storyline. I like their fans. We, we obviously have Randy I'm buddies with Connor. Like I yeah. know some Royals people. So, you know, I'm I'm always going to gravitate toward the fan base that hasn't won in a long time. I just as a as a Red Sox fan, I just always identify with that. But watching them in September, it became pretty clear that if they had a lead after the sixth inning, the game was over. And I, and I, I you know, they sometimes baseball teams are built that way, and, or they fall into it, or whatever. And when you when you have that confidence, like. Hey man, if we just get through the six and we're up three two, this is over. It's done. We're we're going to tomorrow. Um, I think that's one of the most important things you can have in baseball. In fact, is it fair to say that that having those seventh, eighth, ninth inning guys is the single most important thing you can have in the playoffs? Mm, I still go with a starter who can get you through nine and can give up zero runs. But so after you'd that, it's pretty bum, close. You'd rather have Bumgarner. Bum yes. You'd rather have two games of Bumgarner out of seven versus having the seventh, eighth, ninth innings locked down. Yes, I would. First of all, Herrera is already uh, leaking oil here. He's walked well, five true. guys in four innings. And, <laughs> that's Ned Yost's mean, fault, though. Ned Yost well, ran him into the ground. <laughs> he did run him into the ground. But, but, I mean, that's the thing is when you have something that's, a, you know, you're in uh, Vegas and you have one bet that's going perfectly, you're just going to keep betting it or whatever. And, you know, eventually it's going to stop working, but you're just going to wear it into the ground. Except that humans are not like bets. They actually have arms that can break down and, and whatever. The other thing that stands out to me about the Royals, by the way, is and the reason that I do think it is a smart bet to some extent is because the playoff field opened like the freaking Red Sea. If you look at who their opponents were, yeah. you know, Oakland, well, whatever with momentum, we could talk about that or not talk about that, but they had some guys who were kind of playing gimpy and, and not great. And what I said, you know, Sal, as you know, he and I email a little bit about baseball and, and uh, wagering as well. And the thing that I said to him is, it's hard to say what bet I like the best, but the one bet that I really love is, is there a way to short the Angels? I hate the Angels in these this year's playoffs. <laughs> right. Because they lost, you know, they were they won 98 games. They were heavily favored against the Royals. And it's like, hey, guess what? They lost Garrett Richards. And C.J. Wilson can't pitch anymore. And Matt Shoemaker is not 100%. So they have one reliable starter. If the Royals, even if they don't beat Weaver, they can just win the series anyway, just beating the other guys. In fact, they went three straight and got out of there. So, you know, if you believe that the Angels are shortable, and then the Orioles lost much. Machado and Weeders and Davis. Uh, I'm sorry yeah. for Mallory Rubin, of course, our mutual friend and, and my born editor. out of 44. Born out of 40, but you know that was also a weaker team than it should have been. So suddenly, once they got past that A's game, it was like, oh yeah, you know what? They can make the World Series. And of course, once you get to the World Series, anything can happen. I thought the A's were were just. I I just was not a fan. The Angels had the same thing with you. Watched them a little bit. Obviously, they're on the West Coast here, yep. and uh, just seemed like a regular season team. Did not seem like a playoff team to me. Tigers, never really a big fan of that team. And then uh, the Orioles, as you said, I, I think it's really unrealistic to think you could lose those three guys and and not be dramatically affected over the course of October. It's just unrealistic. How do you lose three guys like that and then say, you know what, we're going to make the World Series anyway. So it was shaping up for the Orioles. I guess the, the counter to all of this is Ned Yost who was torturing the Royals fans and who's gotten a lot of play, um, you know, throughout this month, just on the internet and the writings. And I tweeted on Friday night, if this guy had managed the Red Sox during the Pedro era from 97 to 2004, basically, if this had been my manager, I feel like I would be in jail. I, I don't <laughs> think I'd be able to handle it. I feel like I, I, something horrible would have happened. I just would have robbed the store 24 or something. Um, I it, the the thought of him winning the World Series, the thought of Ned Yost being a World Series championship manager, is that the most improbable manager champion ever? Can, can you top it? I don't think I can top it, but Tommy I Tommy Lasorda. That, yeah, I was not a Lasorda fan at all. Uh, that's a good one too, and that was a really improbable team too. By the way, in '88, I mean they had that also very similar team. Come to think of a very good run prevention, they had the one hammer by uh, Kirk Gibson. They couldn't hit other than that. They, they were just, it was Hershiser and Gibson. Lineup. Yeah, it was the worst lineup probably that ever won a World Series, right? You could you could make that case. I mean, I don't know. There might be some dead Mike ball Marshall. or something. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> I mean, Mike Marshall. It was like, come on. A gimpy Kirk Gibson. I have a buddy who's a Dodger fan 
my friend Hershey, and I, re- I make fun of him all the time about how bad that 88 Dodgers team was. And he gets so mad. I was like, just look at the stats. Just go on baseballreference.com. Just look at their averages. That team was terrible. You had no business. But I think the Royals were better than that team. A little bit, yeah. but people treat this as a point of pride, ultimately. They don't say, oh, wow, this team is bad. They say we overcame all odds, and it's an underdog sure. story. So, yeah, well, I think I, the 2013 Red Sox were a little bit like that. That was not a World no Series doubt. championship team. They're easily well, the worst of all the teams the Red Sox had that did anything in, the, in that decade or the last two decades. In 2014, the Red Sox completed something that has never been done in the history of baseball. They went from worst to first to worst. That has never yeah. happened before and, and might not happen for a while. The thing and FYI, you, find, find yeah. me a Red Sox fan who was surprised. <laughs> I guess we that's knew. true. Last year, it was like everything went right. It was just, you know, it was the, the hot blackjack table. It was like, ah, I'm going to hit 16. Oh, we went again. <laughs> it, that's just, you have those seasons and you have those months. And I for the point. Royals, I yeah. think the Royals are... I felt like they were in that zone and then I, you know, everything flipped for them in game four and that sixth inning has just haunted them. It's a, the sixth inning has just been this yeah. inning that, that, that the Royals fans are treating like the uh, Amityville horror house. They're afraid <laughs> to go into the sixth inning. And fa- we were emailing last weekend mm-hmm. and I was saying it really made me mad that Ned Yost had given up on Finnegan. I felt like Finnegan was, Yep. You know, this up and coming, he, he had some, you know, a, a whiff of 2008 David Price potential. Mm-hmm. Just a whiff, a hint. And then they used him in that game six, game four. And of course he got shelled. They got, they got blown out of the game. And uh, and it felt like the, the World Series had turned. Did you think it was over after game four? The, the thing is that momentum doesn't, you know, that and, and, and all this stuff, it, it can turn. It doesn't really matter that much. And, uh, and by the way, we proved this statistically. You know, we looked at uh, uh, this was over for our friends at 538, but I wrote a piece about what does it mean? You know, if you back into the playoffs versus going in uh, on a streak, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything historically. I mean, it, it could manifest itself in one particular team, but on the aggregate, it doesn't really mean that much. And one game doesn't mean that much. You could turn it around. The reason that the Royals – you know, lost momentum at various points in this World Series. It's just because Madison Bumgarner killed them. Well, as soon as Madison Bumgarner stopped pitching, then they had the momentum again. So I don't know about that. And I want to make a point about Yost, too. You talked about this. Yeah. You know, and I actually discussed this with Dave Cameron on my podcast yesterday, but we were talking about the idea of what baseball writing is now. And, and actually, Rob and I wrote about this, too. 60 years ago, or maybe 80 years ago, you had Ring Lardner and Red Smith, and you had these people who, very lyrical, very poetic, very beautiful kind of writing, maybe a little sappy by 2014 standards, but, you Mm. know, they were trying something. And now, it's not just the analytical guys. You know, I'm analytical, obviously, fan graphs and baseball perspectives, but if you're just some mainstream media guy, in the, you go into the, um, press conference afterwards and immediately you're asking why'd you pull this guy in the fourth what about this decision what and we're just scrutinizing this stuff to death and there's no doubt yeah. that yost is not a great manager but i think he has gotten a little bit better and i think more importantly the players kind of still win the games you could say well yost might be the worst manager blah 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 but if your donna ventura is going to throw 100 miles an hour and throw seven shutout innings that's going to matter a lot more than whatever ned yost does so do you like it or do you not like it that baseball in October has now turned into March Madness? <laughs> well, our, our friend Dave Damashek would hate it because he hates March Madness and hates randomness. He doesn't right. even think there should be playoffs in any sport. He just says, hey, you're 15 to 1 like in the, the regular Premier League. season. Yeah, the exactly. Premier League. It just ends in the regular season. He's a big fan of that. Um, but it is amazing. Like, you know, the, the, the adding the second wild card team. And just like Oakland, their season's over in three hours. You yeah. know, they play 162 games. It's over in three hours. You have this Royals team that could have lost that game 19 different times. And now they're here. They're hosting a game seven at home. And, you know, I, I guess that's just what baseball is now. But I do feel like when we were growing up, it was a better representation. Like the best team had a much better chance of winning in the 70s and 80s, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, there were only four teams that made the playoffs. And right. I mean, I, I'm not, well, neither of us are old enough to remember this, but I mean, before 69, then you had, oh, God. It was just one team per league. So you right. could win 103 games and not make it. So, you know, the thing that, uh, and this is right in both of our wheelhouses based on our ages, but like the 1993 race between the Braves and the Giants, which was the last time uh, before the wild card, the last year before the wild card was going to start. And the, uh, you know, one team wins 104 games and gets in, the other team wins 103 and doesn't. That was like the last. 
you know, great traditional kind of pennant race. And, you know, to, to uh, Damashek's point about, you know, what does it mean to get in the playoffs? Well, that, at that point, it still meant a heck of a lot. That's only 21 years ago. So, yeah, things have changed. The second wild card changes things. It depends on your perspective. I mean, if you're a fan of a team like the Royals that, you know, is going up against teams with payrolls three times the size and, you know, it's very difficult, then just to get in, at least it gives you a chance to punch your lottery ticket. I think if you're a fan of a dynastic team or a team that always spends 200 and odd million dollars, then maybe you do resent the fact that you can get knocked off by, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, inferior competition or at least, uh, I would say, poorer competition. Right. The one thing they did that I loved, I like that they condensed the World Series. I, I feel like this... The way that the schedule is now is a much better representation of your 25-man roster. I like the fact that the Giants had to start PV last night and that they have to start Hudson today and that they can't start Bumgarner three times in seven games. I, I always thought that was garbage because that's what you want. You, 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 your, third, your third starter should matter in the World Series, right? You shouldn't be able to ride one guy to win three of the four games that you have to win. I like the way this is, and I like the fact that, you know, the game set for the World Series today is Jeremy Guthrie <laughs> against 75-year-old Tim Hudson. Those are our Game 7 starters. Like, this is great. I love this. Tim Hudson is now the oldest starter ever to start uh, a Game 7 of the World Series, by the way. It was uh, Roger Clemens hold the record before. Or not like a Game 7, but I think just a World Series game in general. But, uh, yeah, it is, it is pretty interesting. And, again, that's the difference between baseball and basketball. You do not have to go with – you know, an ancient, uh, whatever, 40-year-old guy who's at the end of his uh, career in basketball. In, in baseball, you have no choice. You're stuck with that, and that's the way it is. And I think that that's the point at which at least you can look a little bit more at managers because you do understand that Hudson is a potential liability. So what do you do? How do you hedge against that, and how do you figure it all out? You know, it's, it's interesting. The thing that stuck out to me, I, I covered the games in San Francisco. I was there, and I was watching Bumgarner's performance. It's one of the coolest sporting events I've ever seen in person. I mean, that's a great crowd and a great stadium. Yep. And Bumgarner pitched that incredible shutout. But he's throwing pitches in the ninth inning. And, of course, because I'm just the, the, the you know, cold-hearted stats geek, I'm thinking, why is he going out there to complete this game? They could use these 10 pitches, you know, in Game 7, thing. maybe maybe save yeah. them. And he threw them, and maybe it wasn't under duress. He got through one, two, three, and that's fine. But, gosh, every little pitch, now you're thinking, if we could even have Bumgarner for an extra two-thirds of an inning, that'd be huge. They don't have that now. Well, especially because they knew they had PV in game six, which who yeah. was shakier than shaky. And I agree with you. I thought as soon as it got to five, nothing, that's it. He's not coming back out. And I'm thinking about three to four innings from him in game seven. The thing is, it, like I've become fascinated by him this year. I actually became fascinated by him last month because he had that thing with Puig and yep. really wanted to fight Puig was like dying for Puig to come out to the mound so he could pummel him. And, uh, and I heard I heard Buster only on the radio talking about him, and he was saying how uh, the next day, and he was saying how like yeah, this guy, he's in Texas, he's just he's home during the winters, like herding cattle. <laughs> just, like Bob Gardner just sounds like the ultimate cliche of some badass Texas pitcher. He's just awesome, and I think if anyone is built to surprise us in a game seven, be like oh yeah, actually he's going to throw seventy pitches today. It's him. He's certainly the big wild card, and I'm sure that's why the Royals. I just looked it up. They're minus 140 favorites. I'm sorry. I'm sure Baumgartner is like the X factor for Vegas, right? He has to be. And uh, by the way, except for Lincecum, that whole staff, they're all from the South or from Texas. They all kind of have that, uh, that reputation. Peavy's a maniac too. I mean, he's not pitching well, but if you ever watch Peavy yeah. pitch, he's just, he's looks like he's out of his mind. He's going crazy. So yeah, you know, Baumgartner has that. I, I don't know. I, I tend to think on second level. Sometimes the thing that it gets me with Baumgartner is, he threw a World Series game when he was 20 years old. He came out of high school 20 years old, and he pitched a yeah. shutout, by the way. Game one of this World Series, he, he went seven innings and gave up one run. That's the worst World Series start of his career. He's unbelievable. He's been really, really good. And I think it, it's sort of a, you know, we, this came up in Moneyball. I was never draft a high school pitcher ever, ever. They're so risky. Well, of course they're risky, but, you know, if it works out, the payoff is Clayton Kershaw or Madison Bumgarner or Josh Beckett or Roger Clemens or Nolan Ryan. I mean, that's pretty good. That's why people roll the dice on the hope that they're going to hit the lottery. And in Madison Bumgarner, they absolutely hit the lottery. You mean Peyton Manning's little brother, Clayton Kershaw? That's right. <laughs> That's, we could have a whole separate conversation about that. They <laughs> lost that game because they had no bullpen to relieve Kershaw. Kershaw, granted, it'd be nice if he could throw more than six innings, but the bottom line is they let him out to dry because they had nothing except uh, Jansen, and they're not going to Jansen in the seventh listen, inning. Listen, Pedro Martinez in 1999 or 2000 never would have blown a 6 nothing lead at home in game one of a playoff series. It never would have happened. 
Ever. If you're trying to get years. me to argue it against never, Pedro Martinez, happened. good luck. <laughs> never of course I happened. agree with you. Point me to the Red Sox fade who was there for those two years who thinks he would have blown a 6 nothing lead. I'm sorry, right. Kershaw. You're gonna, really going to have to atone for that one if you're going to be in the Sandy Koufax-Pedro conversations. You just are. I like I the atonement reference with the size. Sandy Koufax and Yom Kippur, by the way. That was nicely done. Yeah. Um, so Royals, let's say they win this. Let's just allow ourselves to think about it for one second. The Royals win this. Yeah. Obviously, all these different writers who are attached to the Royals, who some of them are pretty prominent, um, mm-hmm. would go nuts about it this week. It would become this fairy tale team. Amazing. Uh, the sabermetrics community would admit defeat about the Will Myers James Shields <laughs> trade. One of the one of the biggest losses have. this yeah, one of the big losses <laughs> they've had in a while. Um and now this Royals team, you could really argue is set up a little bit here, right? If they win mm. this one, it's it's a nice little foundation here. Hey, they could even if Shields leaves, they have the horses to potentially replace them. And it's not like Shields was, you know, Kershaw. He's replaceable. They have the bullpen. Hopefully Herrera is not blown out forever. Hosmer has emerged into somebody that I'm probably going to overpay for to get him back in the league of darks <laughs> next year. Um, they still have the speed. They have the defense. Like, could this be the start of something a little more substantial? I'm a little more skeptical than you are. I, Shields really mattered a lot um, in the ring. Well, he was there's 200 innings. Pitching. 200 innings, and they were good innings. I mean, he, yes, he was not Kershaw, that's true, but uh, the 200 innings matter a lot, especially when you got guys like Duffy and Ventura, who eventually will mature and, and you know get to the point where you can... And by the way, we've obviously been able to trust Ventura with a workload because we're in Game 6 of the World Series, he's pitching this way, but yeah. you know he helps a lot. You know, it's funny, people have asked me about Shields on interviews and stuff for the last couple of weeks, and, and you know that I know a lot about Shields and, and the Rays and all this stuff, and, and I'm low to say it, but the off-field impact of Shields matters... Maybe yeah. a lot. He, you know, he, Duffy credits him left and right for teaching him a changeup. That the Shields is the guy. And the Royals have this thing, and whatever, we can have a long debate about correlation or causation or whatever. But after every game, the Royals, if it's in April and they beat the Astros four to two, and it's a meaningless game, they have a smoke machine and they have lights and they have a dance party after every single win, not just in the World Series, every single win. Well, Shields got that from the Tampa Bay Rays. Those guys are, you know, another underdog story. Shields was a galvanizer in that clubhouse, and he is in this one, too. They look up to him in that way. I have hmm. no freaking idea if that matters. I don't know. Maybe these guys can, can you know, the ducklings can swim on their own. But, it, yeah, it, I'm saying it might. I'm, I'm, let's put it this way. I'm not an atheist. I'm agnostic about it. It's possible that it matters, and losing him could matter. They'd lose Butler potentially, too, which he hasn't been that great this season, but – uh, that would be a potential loss. He's a free agent. And moreover, they don't have any monster prospects right on the cusp to replace these guys. So they need to go out and sign somebody or trade for somebody to do that. And I think that the margin here, the Royals just barely made the playoffs. If they're only three games worse next year because of Shields and Butler, well, then they miss the playoffs. Now, it's possible that these young guys mature and get better, but we don't know. So I, I think it's a little bit more – I agree with your general stance, but I think it's up in the air. I think it's close as to what might happen in 2015. Well, none of it's going to matter because if Joe Madden goes to the Cubs, we're just going to start sending them World Series championships year after year until 2030 with how stocked they are. Ridiculous. Kudos to Theo and Jed Hoyer. I will My tell you. Boston what... dudes. They have a, they're assembling a juggernaut, <laughs> juggernaut. They just need they need Joe Madden, final piece. That's it. And they, You know they're going to go out and get James Shields. and You know they're getting Lester. I would bet anything they get Lester. I wish there was a way to bet on that. I'm betting Cubs for Lester. <laughs> That's you happening. should be able to do that. I, I, have yeah. to talk, I don't. I don't think this is telling tales out of school. But I approached Theo two weeks ago and I said, "I want to write a book about the Cubs. What do you think?" And and he said, uh, "We've had seven thousand offers, uh, so I'm going to say no to that. But thank you for approaching us and blah blah blah." But that would be fun. I would. I mean, that's a fun team to be embedded with over the next couple of years, which is why I asked, which is why I approached him. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of. A lot of interest there. There's a lot of young guys. There's a lot of good prospects. They need to find pitchers. They don't have them yet, but that's why you sign a lefty. That's why you go out and get guys. They could be, I mean, is it, would it be a bigger story than the Red Sox if they win the World Series? I think the Red Sox fans had more angst and torture, yeah, right. and we had more awful losses. The Cubs have had, like, you know, we had this whole litany of decade by decade, this horrible thing happened in that one. The Cubs have had less of those, mm. and it's it seems like more... My feeling from the Cubs fans is they've almost like given up at even the possibility they would win the World Series. They just go to Wrigley. They have fun. They love being Cubs fans, and they just assume they're going to lose every year. So it's almost yeah. like 
you know, if you're Theo and, and Hoyer, it's, it's almost a better situation than Boston was. Boston was like life or death, people freaking out. The Cubs fans seem like they're just convinced that team is never going to win the World Series in their lifetime anyway, you know? So I think it's kind of liberating in a lot of ways. But if they go out and get two or three of the big, you know, ace pitchers and they get going, I think those Cubs fans, all of a sudden those expectations are going to are gonna flip pretty quickly. You get Joe Madden, you get Lester. Who are the other big starters other than Shields and Lester? Max Scherzer, who's really good. He might be He's better a free than Lester. agent. Yes. Oh, so they'll get him. They'll probably get all three. They have more money than God. Well, the do they Dodgers even have a hundred million payroll yet? No, that's true. They, have, uh, they do have a lot of room. It's, I mean, the owners haven't necessarily been all that willing to spend, but may, you could argue that maybe they've been, you know, just you know, holding their role until they get a chance to really make a run at it. So it's possible that we could see a giant. I want to know. Spending. Well, see, Theo had this whole philosophy when he took over the Red Sox <laughs> about, um, you know, not overpaying for people in their early thirties. Yep. And to to take gambles with people over 30, but try to lock up the people under 30. And I really think that's one of the reasons he fell out with the Red Sox was they became so obsessed with having stars and having people and selling their channel that they had to change that philosophy. And eventually it was like, I'm out of here. So I'll be interested to see if he sticks to what he used to believe in with the Cubs. And you could argue, how old shirts are? He's, I just went and looked it up while you were talking. He was born in July of 84, so he's exactly 30. Mm. And like we, Shields is 30. Shields is Lester, like I think, is still late 20s. Uh, Lester's he's also like 20. 30. He's, he's 30. 30 okay. January of 84. I think Shields is uh, 32 years old. So you, none of these guys. It's, it's very difficult to have a guy who come out when he's 27 or 28. That right. was the thing about A-Rod. I mean, there's a, we could say a million things about A-Rod, but he was 25 years old when he was a free agent the first time. So I so good he was yeah. so young Pablo Sandoval is only 28 too and he's complicated as well but maybe he gets a few extra dollars because he is a little younger than the median free agent last question then we're getting to Connor this is kind of a downer yeah. but I feel like we have to at least mention it Oscar Tavares dies in the car yeah. accident um how good of a prospect was he like who would you com who would you compare him to from an impact standpoint well, uh, you know, in terms of style, the comparison that got made a lot was Vladimir Guerrero, which is wow. terrible. Yeah. I mean, he really, he, he was kind of a free swinger, but he had such an incredible hand-eye coordination that you could get away with it kind of thing. Very, very talented, multi-tools. He was already a big, big kid, 22, but he already was uh, really big and, and a lot of power potential. We didn't see it right away, but he had that big home run in the playoffs, of course, and, and, mm. and really a guy who was beloved. Two articles I would encourage people to check out, by the way. Uh, Jorge Arangure at Vice wrote a great piece talking about the general culture and how it's, you know, for young Latin guys who get a lot of money dropped on their lap and they, they live in the DR of Venezuela, there are perils there, let's put it that way. And it was a good piece. And then uh, Derek Gould from St. Louis Post-Dispatch went to the funeral, and there were 5,000 people at the funeral. It, it wow. really it ripped apart a community. Uh, Cardinals and Cardinals fans are devastated. I mean, I was in tears in the press box, and I don't have any Cardinals allegiance. It was, it was a rough. It was a surreal thing to be at the World Series, and people are going nuts in the stadium. And all around you, at least on Twitter or in the community, people are just like, this is, this is just a tragedy. So – I mean, when when I was growing up, Lyman Bostock got killed. That yeah. one felt big. That, this, Thurman Munson? I, Thurman Munson, obviously, yeah. Um, I don't remember, like, an up-and-coming guy who hadn't even done anything yet, like, who had the prospect level, you know, can't-miss superstar stature that this guy did. I, I mean, we've lost guys like that in other sports, but I don't remember in baseball losing somebody who was, like, that much of a sure thing. The closest comp that I can think of is yeah, well, the closest comp that I can think of is a guy who didn't die of the injury, but it was very bad. Was Tony Canigliaro, which is that's a whole other oh, situation. That's, yeah, like that's I said, he one. didn't die, but his career was absolutely derailed. It's not nearly as tragic, of course, but uh, it was for in terms of just what could have been. That's a big one. Yeah, I'm, I mean, obviously, Len Bias, different circumstances. Sure, um, that's in fact that's but, that might be the best comp of all. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you never get over it. I, I'm you know, Len Bias is would probably be 52, 53 years old right now. I still haven't gotten over that. So I, I, uh, I feel bad for the Cardinals fans, for the family, everything. It's just to have somebody who has that much potential, not just, you know, losing the life, obviously is the worst part of it, but to, to, uh, to, to not have anyone tap into any who had gifts like that, to not be able to tap yeah. into them at all. It's just such a bummer. Um, all right, well, we're going to call, we're going to call Connor in Kansas city. I look forward to reading your, recap 
slash whatever you end up writing about this fascinating game seven. Jonah Carey, thanks for all the good work you did this year in the playoffs. Enjoyed reading you. Enjoyed talking to you as always. Thank you, Bill. All right. As promised, my my longtime producing partner, uh, my buddy, diehard Royals fan, in Kansas City right now, Connor Shell, how are you? I'm super excited, Bill. I'm optimistic. The sun is shining. We had a big win last night. You flew to game six. You had to be talked into it by your wife. You almost didn't want to go unless you were sure they won, and then you were going to go to game seven. I thought that was a little cowardly, I'll be honest. It was totally cowardly. I was trying to cope with the upside of game six, right? Which is you win, definitely game seven to go to. You lose, you kind of don't want to be there. But the truth is that, you know, it's like, I don't want to say this and feel defeated, but like, even if they lost, this has been such a great run that, that like I wanted to be there anyway. So I got on right. a plane, flew to Kansas City, and here we are. You also God, knew Jake... Was- but you knew Jake Peavy was pitching for the other team. That's right. That helped. That helped you get in the plane because you had a really good chance of winning last night with Jake Peavy pitching. There was no, I, I just, I, I was. And, and, right. And against Ventura, which is, you know, that's our best, that's our best matchup. So, uh, yeah, that helped. You were delighted that they, I bet you were delighted that they didn't start Petit in game six. I was delighted. And, and then, I'm even more delighted though that they brought him in and we hit him because yeah. uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much they can use him tonight, but now he was like he was invincible. He was unhittable, and now I feel like maybe some of that mystique is off, right? So we'll see. So I, I wanted to talk about worst case scenarios with you because I think it's really important, and it's something that helped me in 2004 with the Red Sox to go into the game already being aware of all the terrible ways it could go wrong, because I think you guys even saw it in game one. And I told you this was going to happen. We talked on the phone. I was like, you guys are going to lose this game. Everyone's going to go there. It's going to be the greatest moment of every Royal fan's life. Game one of the World Series. We made it back. The crowd's going to be amazing. The intensity and the electricity is going to be off the charts. And then the game's going to start, and you're going to give up a run, and everybody's going to clam up and panic. And that's kind of what happened, right? Is that a it fair was assessment? Tough when, when the Giants, I think, got five straight hits to start the game. Uh, that sort of sucks the energy out of the crowd. But, I, like, I don't know that – it's hard, right? So it's hard to keep – but I don't know that there's bad scenarios for game seven here. Like, I, I just, you know uh, – well, let's, But let's talk about them, though. All right, okay. so – That did happen in game one. You're right. It's but game it, seven. It was a baseball game. Game seven, Guthrie versus Shields. Let's say first inning. Guthrie Hudson. Hudson. I'm sorry, Guthrie Hudson. First inning, the Giants touch up Guthrie for a couple runs, and you're already warming somebody up in the bullpen. Like you're prepared for that scenario, right? Right. That's the that's the worst case scenario. The thing that the thing that really hurt about Game One, that crowd is so amped up. They're so ready to explode you got to get through that first half inning, right? You got to give them a chance to, to be felt. And so, um, that's, so you got to get out of the first, you got to get out of the first. That's right. And then um, obviously if, if you're the Royals, you want to get the lead. So it'd be nice to get the first round. All right. Another bad scenario. That could be a, who, who let's say they, get... but, 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 but it, it, you know, and I have no experience with this. I've never rooted for a team in a playoff series in any sport ever. So, uh, but game seven, all hands on deck. Danny Duffy's ready to go. Yeah. Uh, he was, you know, he was arguably before he got hurt, our best pitcher the second half of the season. So, like, you know, it's not a terrible scenario. So Danny Duffy is, is he's sitting there in the bullpen even before the game started. Starts like, thinking, hey, if I'm two, ready. If two, guys, if two guys get on in the first inning, maybe he comes in the game. Okay. So that's, that's – you, maybe, maybe you're not thinking that way in game one, but you're definitely thinking that way in game seven. That's um, right. And she, another, I, think Shield, I think Shields is available, Vargas is available, and they got that whole back end of the bullpen. Okay. So here's another scenario you got to prepare for. Fourth inning, it's one-to-one. You get two guys on. 
I know let's say third inning actually you get two guys on all of a sudden bum gardeners wa- warming up and now you're thinking all right this guy's not gonna i mean come on this guy's only gonna get pitched a couple of batters right he comes out and proceeds to pitch the next four innings i just want you to prepare for that one right I'm not saying it'll for happen it. I'm not saying it'll happen he's on, he's, he's on two days rest where he pitched 260 innings all season I think you know that, that, that's okay. That means that means we probably have the lead, or are you know are competitive in the game. Um, I he's, not go, he's not. He's not going to go seven. And and we hit fatigue. We can hit that bullpen. I'm ready for it. Okay, and you're prepared emotionally for Petit and Bumgarner to pitch a combined six innings in this game. Because that might yeah, happen too. Maybe. That Maybe. might happen. Yeah. I'm excited, Bill. Why are you trying to talk me out of being excited? Okay. I'm I'm super excited for you. I just want you to I want you and the Royals fans to just sort this out in your head mentally so you're not blindsided because part of but the here, biggest so, game of the year so is here, not to be here's, blindsided. Here's, here's the thing though. This is all this was all unexpected, right? It, this is all just fun. So I you know, like that that's what makes these crowds so great. They're they're so they lost for so long. But it's not like anyone, you know, in July, August, this team was like, I mean, they were four, five, six games back from Detroit. Like, they were losing to Oakland in the wild card game badly. badly. Like, nobody expected this. So now it's game seven of the World Series. Like, you know, this is just, like, this is just fun. There's no, right. there's no panic. There's no panic here, Bill. This isn't the 2004 Red Sox. Or all right, first or, of all, you know, I... I I hate everything you just said. You have a chance to win the World Series tonight. Your life will be gonna, forever and altered. And they're going to win because everybody has that attitude. That's the this thing. This is fun. What, what are we at? Like a nine, a nine and under soccer game? <laughs> Maybe we just shouldn't keep score. Let's just play the game and not keep score. No, no, no. You have a chance I, to win the World Series. All right, and we're going to win. That's the that's the whole that's the whole thing. Like Hold that, on, we, that's what we got to walk through. One more scenario. All right. There's three scenarios we've covered too. Here's the third one. The sixth inning has haunted you this entire season. Every Royal fan gets to the sixth inning and it's almost like you're trying to walk across a highway. A highway that doesn't even have a lot of traffic. You're just trying to get across the highway and you're like, if I just get across the highway, I'm good. This sixth inning, you know it's going to happen. It's the law of baseball that whatever microcosm of whatever has gone on good and bad with your season plays out in the biggest game of the year. And you know, the sixth inning is going to be a torture chamber. So my question to you is Guthrie gets, you get five out of, out of, out of Guthrie. Can't bring him back for six. He's throwing like 90 pitches. It just doesn't maybe use a pincher, not a pincher. Uh, right. It's a third guess, time through the order. And, and yeah. yeah. Um, right. Do you pitch Herrera for two innings? Do you want well, to see that's Finnegan? What, that, that's what secretly made last night. So great. It wasn't just that they won. It's that they won convincingly enough. And, and like, I don't think five Hans would have been convincingly enough for, for Yost to not even get Herrera up in the bullpen. Right. So yeah. now it's the last game you're up two to one in the fifth or sixth. And you can go Herrera for two Davis for two Collins. Right, like if you need if you need to get five innings out of those guys, you probably have it in them. So you would pitch Davis for two because normally he doesn't well, if, do that. No, he normally doesn't do that. I'm just saying, like in this in this scenario, like that's I, I think the sixth inning is less scary. Or okay. so one and one and two thirds for Herrera, one and a third for Davis, and a, you know you got to get four. Is it wrong for me to think? that Finnegan should be heard from in this game. I like the thought of him at home. I think the crowd going crazy. I think he would throw like 119 miles an hour in this game. Maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe you start the sixth with him and see if you can get through it before you get Herrera up. Or do you not, you don't see Finnegan in this game. I don't ever pretend to think I know what Ned Yost is going to do with this bullpen, but I don't, I don't see him doing that. Okay. So no Finnegan. So you're you're riding these three guys, all of whom have rest, and your closer hasn't pitched since I think Friday. That's right. 
Can he pitch two go. innings? He can, right? I think if you're laying out a scenario where Bumgarner can pitch five innings or four innings, yeah, these guys can all. Holland can throw an, an inning and two thirds if they need him to. Can so what if Duffy comes in for the sixth? Is that conceivable? Well, so he was in this scenario in the wild card game against Oakland. This exact scenario you're describing, and he, he went to Ventura. Ventura. Yeah, and he went to Ventura. So, who knows? Who knows with you, Ned? Um, who knows? Do you think, That's right. Is it, how, if you had to say days, months, or years? By, God. by the way, Ventura, I think, was on, was on either one or two days rest at that point. It doesn't, like, I, you know, I think that just, that, that sort of shows they'll do anything here. That was a mistake. I didn't like that when you did and that. It was a mistake, but, right. So, how many months and or years has Ned Yost taken off your life in the last five weeks? I can't answer that. You can't answer that? But let's say you were going to live to, let's say God had decided you were going to live to like 92. Now is it, is 90 realistic? Did So the thing is that like these moves, God, they like you hate them while they're happening. And, 80 percent, whatever the percentage, most of the time they end up working out and it's that's, amazing. you know, so it's like amazing. at a certain point you just shake your head and you say, I'm not going to question this. It doesn't make any sense, but you know, yeah, yeah maybe, so there you and go. maybe that's the, that maybe that's your destiny. Maybe <laughs> Ned Yost was destined to be a world series winning manager and it doesn't make sense. And none of this makes it's, sense. Uh, that was, uh, uh, Whitlock wrote a great, a great column about the legacy of crazy Royals managers. And, and that was sort of the conclusion he came to. You can't, you can't be sane to have this job. What, what made you the proudest as a Royals fan? Was it Eric Hosmer's inexplicable belated emergence into the next George Brett? <laughs> or something else? It, well, you know, What's great about this is that these guys are all like you've been, we've been. You just had Jonah on, right? Uh, yeah, I've, I've been reading about him touting these guys for what you know five, six, eight years in some cases, and so they're always on my fantasy team. I picked up and dropped Mike Mustakis for you know on my fantasy baseball team fifteen times in the last two seasons. Right. Um, so to see Escobar and Kane and then Mustakis and Hosmer and each one of these guys like have their moment, right? And each one of them sort of carry this like, yeah, but I mean, I'd say it's Hosmer. He looks like a star for the next five years. He looks, and he's like the emotional fulcrum of the team too, I feel like. He's kind of, yeah. you need a guy like that and he's that guy. It's kind of kind of the guy who comes through, the leader, the guy, the first guy out of the dugout. Him and Mustakis have a great greeting combination in the dugout. Like they just, they're so fired up. I really enjoy it. It almost, if I was a GM, I would, I would, I would scout how people perform in the dugouts for those things because I do feel like it it adds to the team's potential in some weird way. Well, um, this is what people say about James Shields, right? <laughs> Yeah, Jonah talked about that, that actually. That he's the that he's the um, you know the, that that's why they wanted him, and you know he, he, it's uh, there you go. Well, you've been a Kansas City sports fan since forever. Is this the greatest month in the history of Kansas City sports? Because we also have had the improbable Chiefs come back. That happened too. Yeah, uh, in twenty five years of following Kansas City sports now. This is, you know, yes. The answer is yes, right? The 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 Royals, the Royals are in the World Series, which is the greatest thing to happen, you know, in three decades here. And the Chiefs look like a good football team. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing. As I what's said, the, Bill, you, you're you're catching me at a tone of optimism here. What's the vibe on the streets? What's it like to be in Kansas City today? Every single person here is wearing a royal shirt. Literally every single person. Um, 
and everybody's talking about going to this game or watching this game. Uh, and it was the same thing yesterday. My, my entire flight here was filled with people in Royals t-shirts and hats. It's amazing. Mm. It's totally amazing, Bill. I don't know what to tell you. That's the best. I think baseball, and I don't know if baseball is the most popular sport anymore, but there's something about when the city gets behind the baseball team. And it's the, one of the things I miss the most about living in Boston, where there'd be a big Red Sox weekend, like the Yankees were coming to down, or a big Red Sox playoff game, and you just walk around downtown, and it's just Red Sox hats. And that's... Well, and, and the thing that, like, so under, as I said, I've never rooted for a team in, in my entire life that has played in a playoff series, right? Yeah. Um, so you just like, it's so much, you know, it's so great to have the payoff of one game here in a game seven, but it's so much fun that there's just so many of these games, right? That it it's just kind of, it can own it, you know, it can own the space, it owns the city for a month here. You know, yeah. it's not like, oh, the Chiefs made the playoffs, we've got one game. It's the greatest. It's, you get, and basketball is like that too. If your team can go four rounds in basketball, it's two and a half months of your of your year. You're just looking forward to games and waiting for the next game. And hockey's like that too. Football, football, you you're gonna play four games at the most probably. But it is fun to just get lost into. Plus, like baseball is just so excruciating to watch. It's like you know these four hour marathon games, pitch after pitch, and manager decisions, and just you know it's the whole thing is just a heart attack. It's it. 03 and 04. I do. I do feel like the 03 04 Red Sox combined probably took a couple years off my life. I'm convinced. You know, yeah, it's just how it goes. But like, the, like the, again, back to the difference of mindset of like when you keep getting so close, like that. You know, and and I may be you know regretting this statement in in a few years, but when you keep getting so close and losing. Right, that there's a different level of frustration that goes into it than God. None of these fans have been anywhere near anything right. like this. It's I agree. A it's a much happier vibe to it. Joan and I talked about that just now, but the difference between the Cubs and the Red Sox. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's like the Royals fans are that's like that's, that's the Cubs have the Cubs. You're saying the Cubs have no expectation. Yeah, the Cubs are just like. Everyone who roots for the Cubs, you know, they're they're tortured in a different way, but they just assume it's never going to work out. The Red Sox fans had been just paralyzed by all of these moments where they we had fallen just short and just haunted by all these different things. And the Cubs fans, the Bartman thing was, you know, the big one for them. But for the most part, I feel like, you know, they it's it's a happier vibe there. Like Wrigley's just fun, and you go. There have been, I mean, like for Royals fans, the last. Two decades. I mean, right? They hadn't made the playoffs since '85, but they were a good team until '94. I mean, and yes, we had that's fair. We had great, great players, great moments. David Cohn, you know, was the best pitcher in baseball for a few, few years in the early '90s. There, here, um, but over the last two decades, like I can't remember. I mean, Granky had that one great season, but the Royals, I think, won 60 games that year. Like to just to watch that, to be at that game last night, to watch Ventura, to think like, man, this guy's on our team. He's 22 years old. Like he's going to be on our team for the next five years. Like yeah. the Royals and the Royals fans have never experienced anything like that. And it's like, it's not just Ventura. It's, you know, there's 15 guys on the team like that who, who are young and are like, you know, exciting. And they, you know, and they play an exciting brand of baseball. So uh, this is cool. Did you feel guilty at all that game six of the World Series with your team cannibalized the best thirty for thirty we had this fall? The boss <laughs> thirty for thirty. Did you feel at all, any at all guilt there? So the the, the Royals scored seven runs in the bottom of the second inning. So hopefully people change the channel, Bill. It was the game was never in doubt, right? You didn't have to watch it. Do you think Boz's son is going to get <laughs> nominated for an Emmy Award? Say, have we have I, we ever used a sibling or a family member or a son or a daughter better at a thirty for thirty than Boz's son? He was like Jeremy Shap. I love I love that I I love that documentary and I love that approach to it. I just thought it was like 
what a smart way for him to sort of tell his story and, you know, talk about what it was like to be that age. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think we've got like, allow me to plug here for a second. Please. I, I wanted between, you to. Between that film last night, brothers in exile, which next is next Tuesday, a, next Tuesday about El Duque and Levon Hernandez, which is just like, that's my favorite one we've done in a while. And I don't, you know, I, these things like, they're like your I, kids. I love, yeah, you I don't love every, you, we love all I, of them. I don't have, love all of them. I never want to disparage any of them, but I, I just, I just think that story and the way, the way Mario and, and, and Dave check and his team tell it, it's like, God, that is, that film is so good. And then the Randy Moss film is incredible on November 11th. Like this is this whole run of, of 30 for 30s has been great. Um, but, the, Randy uh, Moss, the Randy Moss film suggested by my buddy Bish. <laughs> His great legacy in life now. He, he made a Randy oh, Moss was, 30 for 30 I thought, happen. I thought, you went, I thought you went down a Randy Moss high school basketball highlight rabbit hole on YouTube and suggested that. I think or, he, that, was, that was Bish. Well, I thought it was he. I We asked him, because Bish is one of the big college football fans, asked him if there are any 30 for 30s. And I think he just kind of mentioned Randy Moss. And I went on a rabbit hole and, and never came back. And I was like, we just, we need some sort of doc where we just show Randy Moss footage from high school, high school, college. And we so, can't go wrong. And so what, what ended up being incredible about that documentary is that Marquise Daisy took that, went and like, there's great highlights here. There's incredible basketball and, you know, and the football highlights are, of, of him in high school are mind-blowing. I mean, well, they're mind-blowing. We, we thought it was going to be a but short. Then, we right, we but then, Initially, it was like, yeah, let's do a 15-minute short on Randy Moss. But then he found this story, and he got, um, I mean, and not found it, but the, the story of, of sort of uh, uh, what Randy went through in high school and, and going to college is, is known. But Marquise got people to talk about it, and got Randy to talk about it and, uh, you know, it took the idea of a short and, and, and made it a 60 minute film. That's, you know, it's riveting. If you're a football fan, it's riveting. Well, what's interesting is when we did the Bo Jackson one, we didn't really have a story, but we didn't care. It was just like, let's, the Bo Jackson highlights are so great. Let's somehow craft this around a story where this guy who's the natural gets injured. It's, but, it's Paul Bunyan or a mythical figure or whatever. Right. Right. But they're, there really, there really wasn't that much of a story arc to Bo Jackson. It was unbelievable athlete. He gets hurt. And that's really the whole story. Randy Moss. I had no idea how emotionally damaged he was from the stuff that happened to him in high school and college and how well, he I carried think, that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's because of when it happened or just he wasn't as well known or, or where he was from. But like, I don't think anyone knows the details of how he got, from high school to Marshall and right. what he went through fairly and unfairly and, you know, um, what he had to deal with. And, and it makes, it gives so much context to who he is. I just right. understand that, that period in his life. Right. We didn't have to show anything and from the, his and, NFL and, career. And then, I, and then I go back to the highlights. Like, it's like Bo Jackson, said Bo Jackson, you know, Marcus Dupree, the high school highlights of him were off the charts. And then, you know, and, and Randy Moss's highlights are, are right there. And, you know, we, we did, uh, we did this film, uh, this series for Disney XD called becoming about how an athlete becomes kind of the formative years of how an athlete becomes a star. And there, and the first one was done with LeBron James. It's on D Disney XD. You can watch it with your kids. I uh, I watched it with my kids last night, and it was the first thing we've ever done that I've watched with them, and they loved it. And it was like I was just super happy that to that we did something that my kids could then enjoy. But the LeBron footage from eighth grade, ninth grade is so incredible. I, I think I feel like I could have watched that all day. The fourteen year old <laughs> LeBron with that little weird afro he had, and just like just dominating right. his thirteen year olds. <laughs> Turns out he's really good at basketball. Yeah, uh, uh, turns out he was good the whole time. At every point of his life, he was freaking awesome. What a surprise! Yep. Uh, yeah. So, but 
that, I, I love that show. I mean, it's like, I'm, I'm the, the, it's on, I think it's on again on, it's also on ESPN on November 7th. And right. The whole approach is like, let's tell this great story of an athlete, how they became who they were and do it in a way that's relatable to kids. Right. Who, who, so there's nothing relatable about LeBron James's talent, but if you tell his story, like so many elements of it are what every young kid who plays sports goes through. Um, and I hope we, I hope we do 50 more of those and, and, and can do it with, you know, athletes from every single sport. Cause now, I mean, now that the thing is like, what's incredible back to the highlights piece of it, like what's incredible about Marcus Dupree is that someone shot that on film, whatever, 35 years ago. What's yeah. incredible, the, the Randy Moss highlights is that it was like pre YouTube and their high school games that I guess were televised or whatever. But if you deal with current athletes now, like you're dealing with people who, who every single game they've ever played in may have been shot on an iPhone, right? Right. Like my daughter. So, I've had like yeah, 20 so now, of my so daughter's games like, already. So now you can like, when you, you know, if you make a show like this, now you can actually like go back and say like, well, here's the, this moment that people are talking about. Like, here it is. This is, you know, their mom shot it on whatever. And the reason, becomes- well, the reason we came <laughs> up with this show was because we did an SCC stories about Abby Wambach and a big part of that, a big part of that documentary about her was about how she grew up in high school and in college and how she kind of belatedly emerged into a badass, but she was always a badass and there's high school footage of her, which is just really awesome. And it's just, you know, it's just clear. Like she was headed to bigger and better things. She's bigger and stronger than everybody. And I watched it with my daughter and you know, who plays soccer. I was on a club team who loves soccer. And there was this one part in the documentary when Abby Wambach, who's playing forward, you know, in some tournament, you know, she's playing forward for her high school team, but it was penalty kicks. And she asked the coach to put her in a goalie to stop the penalty kick. Cause she was a forward. So they switched them and she went in and she stalked around the, around the goal and tried to psych out the other girl. And the girl ended up missing the penalty kick. And my daughter like loved that story. She thought it was like amazing. And, you know, the the thing about shows like that is when you watch them with your kids, they see that they see whoever that athlete eventually became. They're just seeing them as the kid and they're thinking like, oh, I could I started out that way. I was being filmed by the same crappy cameras. Like, so there is something right. there. I'd, I'd love to see us. And that like, was like, so, so, so Aaron Lydon, uh, um, who, who made the Abby Wambach doc and, and also produced this first episode of a coming that was like she when she went and made the abby film uh it, it was like there, there's the one there's the, and i'm you know I, I don't have the details perfectly in my head but there's the one loss that like it's so clear that that became like a motivating thing for abby wambach through her whole career right she hadn't yeah. gotten over it um, like, like to this day, she's the world record holder in goals scored. And she still has a chip on her shoulder about that one loss. Um, and it just became clear through that what, you know, and, and, and I think it became clear to Aaron and, and when she went to go do this on LeBron, like it, it's not necessarily that story, but every athlete has a story like that, right? Like one moment, a few moments that, define kind of how they got on the path to who they are. Right. So that's the whole, the whole point of it. Yeah. It's the little checkpoints that lead to whatever happened to them. So that shows about the checkpoints, which I, the thing that's cool and the, the reason I hope we do a title checkpoint. Well, the reason we, we think we could do 50 to 75 or a hundred <laughs> of these is every athlete's one is different. Like I'd love to see a Jonathan quick one. Jonathan quick's been the best goalie in hockey for this whole decade. And he's this kid who was at prep schools in Connecticut. You know, he grew up here. He was in that whole show and over like a, that whole prep school scene, just, just stopping goals. And there had to have been a couple of checkpoints with him where people were like, my God, this guy might be head of the NHL. 
So I want to, I want to, I want to learn all these stories. I want to see Blake Griffin. What happened with him and his brother? How'd they grow up? So I, 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 I do like this one. I think this will be, this will be a good series. I'm, I'm, we can, and, we can a do a title. whole collection. We can do a whole collection on Eric Hosmer, Mike Moustakis, <laughs> James Shields, Ventura. <laughs> Ned Yost, how, he, how Ned Yost became the most confusing manager who ever won a World Series. We could do that one, all the checkpoints there. We can even do one on, on Will Myers, Bill. So. Uh, poor Will Myers. He could have been a part of this whole thing. Um, yeah, so we have, we have how many more 30 for 30s left? We have. So, uh, so two more 30 for 30s next Tuesday and on November 11th, and then the U Part 2. Yes. Airs in December after mm-hmm. the Heisman, um, and that's it for 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 this run. And then um, Becoming is on ESPN on November seventh, and it's on Disney XD between now and then. Um, and there you go. Well, and then we also have the giant mega box set coming out for Christmas that has every thirty for thirty in it. That's happening uh, too. One one hundred thirty for thirties. One hundred. Yeah, since we five it's, years in, including the shorts, it's the there's a hundred of them that come out. It's everything released through July of this year. So none of the ones from this fall, but the the hundred from two thousand and nine until July twenty fourteen. This is great. We've done a hundred thirty for thirties. We have some great ones coming up. We did this Becoming show. We did the Grantland Basketball Hour. Your Royals are one win away. The Chiefs are back. Life is looking up for Connor Shell. This is really good. Uh, let's let's just savor this moment right for a now. second. Let's savor it. Let's <laughs> let's let's sniff the air and just say life is good right now. October 29th. It's a good day. There you go. Uh, yep. Good luck tonight. Thank you. Good luck Thank tonight. You. Uh, you, uh, you, you should send an email to, to uh, our now mutual friend, Randy J. Zaleri. I'm, I'm worried for his health. Um, I saw him after the game last night, and, and I, I can't even describe the emotional state he's in right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have him on the podcast, uh, hopefully after after you win. Probably not after you, you lose, because if, if, if you lose... If you lose tonight, he might not be seen for a couple weeks. That, that, that might be right. All right he Bill, might just be you. wandering. Good luck. <laughs> Give a hug to all the Royals fans tonight. Take it home with this thing. We'll be back on the BS Support a little bit later this week. Thanks for listening. So I get the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Geico presents Strange Savings Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance.